Hopefully everybody got some good talks in today, learned a lot of cool new things, right? Yeah, yeah awesome, awesome. So uh, this talk is going to be a little bit of a departure from what I normally talk about or the types of things. Uh, typically it's a little more technical. Um, this is going to be, of course, more focused on the privacy aspect and uh, you know, just the psychological aspect of uh, owning you know, smart devices or using the Alexa service in general. So the title of this talk, Alexa Knows My Kids Better Than I Do, I think kind of sums up uh, the state of devices today, really, you know, just, just their invasiveness or their pervasiveness into uh, our daily lives. And uh, I'm going to go back through that course here in just a minute. Uh, other than uh, what has been introduced already, I am a husband and father of four. I am also known as the co-manager of household operations at my home. I work for Security and Solutions, as mentioned, and I mainly deal with enterprise security monitoring solutions, so helping people to stand up uh, host-based intrusion detection systems, uh, network-based intrusion detection, uh, log management, uh, types of stuff like that. So I uh, definitely love doing that stuff. However, this course, again, is a nice departure from that. Uh, I love coffee. I have to have coffee in the morning. Please don't talk to me if I haven't had it. Haven't had it, and I am an open source security software enthusiast, which means uh, I love going through, you know, just like security and it's completely open source, I love going through and looking at other tools uh, that can be of use to enterprises and really trying to tie those together to, to make them effective. So, again, our world today, there's really a complex assortment of devices. Um, everywhere you look, everywhere you go, you're either being recorded. Uh, somebody or someone is listening to you, uh, and these devices, a lot of them, you know, the, their roles really are as an assistive presence, so a digital assistant, uh, maybe to help with collaboration uh, with coworkers, uh, or maybe just for entertainment purposes, right? We wanted to tell us a joke, or uh, we want to hear a song, uh, things of that nature. So being a parent, and uh, really just a human being in general this day and age is kind of scary because of all these things. Um, again, so many things to interact with, um, and so much data captured and really uh, stored outside of our control, um, or you know we don't know if it's been duplicated and sent elsewhere. Uh, just lots of things to consider uh, whenever we use these types of devices and services. So Alexa, in general, most of you probably know what Alexa is already, um, or has an Alexa enabled device. Uh, does anybody here have an Alexa-enabled device in their home that they're currently using? Okay, cool, cool. So, in a nutshell, uh, just a virtual assistant developed by Amazon, uh, super popular these days. Uh, it uses natural language processing to uh, go do things for you and bring back the results. Um, and it ultimately just provides a capability for automation and convenience, right? So just allowing you to go do stuff like setting a timer or playing a song or, or something else. Um, just hopefully saving you time and giving you some benefit out of that process. Now, there are a ton of Alexa-enabled devices. Uh, you can see a few here, of course, the Echo, Echo Dot, uh, Show, um, and of course they're integrated into other third parties like Netgear so uh, hardware, I'm sorry, GE. Uh, so smart switches. Uh, smart outlets, all sorts of stuff. Even devices running Windows 10 can use Alexa along with uh, Cortana. So uh, once again, it gives you a lot of capability, or really Amazon, a lot of capability to peer into your life and the lives of your family to see what's going on, see what you're doing. A few stats. Um, so. Right here, some of these are, are from different time periods, but uh, was really the, you know, the most, uh, I guess, credible that I could find. Uh, so 20,000 number was the number of unique devices on which uh, Alexa is available, right? So you're talking about across hardware manufacturers, you're talking about different models and stuff like that. Um, and the number of skills available. So skills typically refer to, uh, you know, something Alexa can do, like a service, reaching out to a service and getting back results and getting those results too. And then finally, a hundred million, there are a hundred million devices running Alexa in general, or sold, at least to the public, uh, today. And that was uh, at the end of Q4 of 18, so they're obviously going out. So, 
So how it works in a nutshell, and this isn't extremely technical at all, so please um, forgive any technical uh, inaccuracies. Uh, but in general, Alexa is waiting on a wake word, right? So it's waiting on you to give it that hot word to trigger uh, and do its thing. So it's always listening. Um, you know, a little blue light indicator, it'll show you that the device is listening, at least for the Echo devices. And it will go off once you say that hot word, or that wake word, and then it will go off to the cloud servers. Uh, it'll say, hey, what you got for me? You know, with, give, me some, give me some, give me some to work with. But either way, you know, once it's received, you know, once it's triggered that hot word, uh, the servers are going to store that voice, re that voice recording. Um, and then they're going to try to, if you have uh, the development features enabled, um, they're automatically going to try to train Alexa with that. Um, and they're just going to store it indefinitely on their servers unless you go mess with it or review it. So it, once again, once it gets back those results, it spits it out to you and either understood what you said or it didn't and uh, you, know, you get something back yourself. Also how it works in a nutshell, this sounds like wake word. Right? And I think this happens all too often with, with many folks, and, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in just a second. But this other guy's, you know, I hope this isn't being recorded, this secret conversation. And Alexa's like, don't worry, it is. And then the cloud says, once again, let's store it. So they still store the data, even though it wasn't a valid request. And then Alexa just comes back, won't respond, or it'll just tell you it doesn't know what it is. So it's, it's something to keep in mind that not only you know those valid requests, um, you know it's listening in for that wake word, and not only those valid requests that provide the wake word, but ones that sound acoustically similar, um, it may not be able to effectively discern it, and you know that's that's going to be a flaw with with software in general. So once again, a wake word is not always a wake word. Mistakes happen. Everybody knows computers are hard. Humans are not perfect, nor are the machines that they intend to perfect. Right? So an imperfect human cannot create a perfect machine. Therefore, we have to expect that some mistakes are going to occur. And some data is going to be collected when it was not intended to. And here's Chuck Norris just kicking an echo dive version two, just for fun. I like that. Me too. All right, so data collected. Um, Amazon collects a lot of data, uh, not just you know, not just Alexa, but Amazon in general. And I won't go into that. But through the Alexa service, um, it's really trying to provide. It's extending to you that service to provide a 360 degree view of yourself to Amazon. Um, and this is all really for Amazon to, of course, potentially make more money from you down the road. <laughs> They're trying to build a profile of you, right? So um, a lot of times when, when folks think about, you know, they're taking my data and you know, it's going to be sold to third parties and stuff like this, uh, it's not necessarily the case with Amazon or the Alexa service, um, it's much more valuable for them to have your data and be able to use that data uh, and have it exclusively since I believe it was 75% of most folks doing online shopping have done it through Amazon this past year. So they definitely want that information. They don't want to give that away so easily. So some of the data that it collects is with regard to language, right? So our vocabulary, the words that we use, right? So uh, people with different upbringings may use different vocabulary. Um, you know, pe just people in general, right? Just depending on their education level or their own personal preferences. Um, and it seeks to understand that to better train the service, right? So it's taking that voice recording and everything that it's learning from you and analyzing all those words that you say. In addition, your speech patterns, so maybe your cadence, right? So the way that I am talking now, it may see things like that and better learn to process speech with pauses, uh, or things like that. So there are a lot of different ways that it processes or it interprets your language to, again, better appeal to you in the future. 
So personal preferences, honestly, a lot of you know websites or services do this, but again, this is you know using the service. It's again another entry point to providing that data and compiling uh, that profile that they're looking for. So it might be genres of music for which you're searching, um, specific artists, things like that. It might be types of venues for you know if you're looking to go out, get a drink, have a bite of pizza, uh, things like that. And of course, maybe styles of clothing that you purchase. Um, what, what you'd like to wear. Uh, it's, it's all looking at these different things, trying to build that image of you. And once again, this kind of goes in hand, uh, sorry, in hand in hand with the uh, personal preferences. Uh, of course, a lot of those personal preferences are going to be tied to certain buying habits, right? So while people may not always act on the purchase, uh, you know, from searching for these different items, uh, and they're still going to track the types of things that you're buying, the brands of things that you're buying, how often you're buying it. Um, are there certain intervals that you buy uh, so maybe they can recommend or, or they can fold in some type of discount later based on your buying habits, right? It's all for that, that almighty dollar. Some other data. So if you have any smart switches, Right? Any smart like outlets, uh, house fixtures, lamps, uh, stuff like that, stuff like thermostats that use Alexa, maybe like Echo B or something. Um, it's going to store all of that data as well. So you'll get uh, status indicators from that, various details from those devices. Right? And it's going to store all that and, like, once again, correlate all that with your other activity. So once again, I just want to reiterate on the voice recordings that Alexa, or I'm sorry, the uh, Amazon is storing through this Alexa service, uh, you have those clips of audio that are stored from successful and unsuccessful attempts. So again, that's something to keep in mind. And these are really stored indefinitely unless they go out and prune them because, um, you know, if there's no need to get rid of that data and relinquish some of that, uh, you know, that marketing power or appeal, then they won't do it. And by the way, I'm not trying to make an Amazon out of some, some bad guy. Just, just they are, we know it. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so data review. Uh, you might have seen this in the news recently. Uh, it came out and was popular in the last few weeks. Uh, but Amazon actually employs a lot of people that look at these voice recordings. Uh, they're essentially trained to go through and look at these and help train the Alexa service to uh, better utilize these voice recordings and interpret them. Um, so it helps them to transcribe that. Uh, to, uh, the workers help Amazon to yeah, transcribe that information. And while I mentioned that loaded details are paired with these recordings, I still feel like an account number, a first name, and a device serial number are still not something that I would want associated with a recording. And I would think that it's yes. still not that difficult to correlate that with a user identity, right? Either through another customer service representative or some other access that that employee has. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that gives me a little pause. Um, and once again, recordings, you know, they can consist of private conversations, singing in the shower, uh, children crying for help, you know, maybe they got a boo-boo and they're asking for dad or mom, or even criminal activity, right? I mean, it's anything, anything that can be recorded. So uh, a few cases in the news, um, I mentioned that they announced the, uh, the workers analyze, analyzing the recordings, but uh, there was also another case, so State versus Timothy Barrel. Uh, this was a double murder case in which uh, an echo device was present. And the judge actually ordered the recordings to be turned over to the state of New Hampshire. Um, you know, this is something that we're going to see then and again. Uh, you know, time and time again, as these devices proliferate in people's homes, uh, we're going to see potentially turned over to government for some sort of purpose or you know, for, for, uh, to either prove or disprove a crime. Right? Uh, another case, James Bates in Arkansas, was another suspected murder of a colleague. Um, it was eventually dropped to charges where he actually voluntarily handed over the recording. So in that case, um, you know, it might have actually helped him that he had that and it disproved their hypothesis or at least uh, did not give any credence to you know, their other arguments. Uh, and also a family in Portland, Oregon, you might have heard about this one. 
uh, they were talking about some hardwood floors, just chilling at home. And for some reason or another, Alexa thought they wanted to initiate interaction with Alexa. And then that private conversation actually got sent to one of the husband's contacts, one of his workers, uh, his employees. So there's definitely some, uh, some stuff there that, uh, once again, kind of gives me pause and, and I struggle with, with some of it because of you know, things like this. Ultimately, it's about trust, right? We are trusting Amazon to protect our data as well as our children's data whenever they're recording this. Right, and the best assurance that we have is the things, or are the things that they tell us, you know, through public announcements, uh, through the terms of use on the website, through the privacy settings that we enable or disable, and that's really all we know, unless you know there's some some big breach, right, uh, where it comes out that you know some things were handled as we thought they were not going to be handled. So that's really all we have is trust. Right. We can trust them, but honestly, we have no way to verify. Right? Trust but verify. Now I want to talk about kids. So obviously, all you guys know, kids know, you have a lot of technology at school, right? Interact with a lot of technology. So you know, there's computer-based learning, all this uh, STEM, right? All these activities that are allowing kids to interact with uh, you know, different services and, and different concepts. Um, and it's important that we really teach them these things well. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, and of course at home, right? Other technology, entertainment purposes like YouTube, Facebook, they might play Fortnite, Minecraft, Roblox, and my kids have. Technology is not necessarily a bad thing, um, just with adults, profiles. Uh, so Amazon, all sorts of people, you know, internet services are leveraging those profiles and data points uh, to market and appeal to various folks, right? And that's one thing that we have to keep in mind as parents, uh, how our kids interact with that. How, what kind of profile they're going to have published by the time they're 18 already, having interacted with these services. And profiles, right? So. Profiles really consist of hundreds, sometimes thousands of data points. Uh, it just depends really on what aspects of these services that you interact with. Uh, you know, they're gathered through various interactions. Those personal details that I had spoke of before um, are all garnered into this profile. And typically those profiles are paired with things like predictive analytics, right? So to make decisions basically about how it's going to market to users, uh, what's going to appeal to them, and things of that nature, right? And these profiles may even yield details that maybe parents don't know about their kids, right? How they interacted with the service, uh, details that the regular conversation, a regular interaction, us as human beings would not know. So it's very important that we are, are aware of that activity and uh, you know, just, just thinking about that kind of in the back of your head, what kind of profile are you setting up? for you know, your children or what kind of profile are they going to have when they're older. Again, use of technology with limited knowledge or awareness can be dangerous. It can cause unintended consequences, right? And I, I promise I don't have the tinfoil hat on. I'm just trying to, trying to keep you, you know, just thinking about these things. Um, and potential long-term irrevocable effects, right? Everything that we put on the internet can't remove it. It's there forever, right? And this activity, or uh, you know, this limited use, is really propagated through social norms, right? It's normal to use Facebook, right? It's normal to use Alexa. It's normal to do all of these things. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So social norms, really, what are they? They're unwritten rules of behavior, uh, acceptable behavior in a society, and you have various types. Of course, both ways, more is taboo, so won't get in that, into that too much, but they essentially exist to provide order in society, and really, it's important for us to, as human beings to be effective in society, to conform to the norms, right? Right? We need to be an effective member of our society, 
Uh, and in the past, expectation of privacy was always a social norm, right? So it's just a given. Now it, it's a little different now. So going a little bit more on social norms, they're driven by advancements in technology. So things like watching Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, playing Fortnite again, uh, or utilizing smart devices in general. These have become social norms for us, right? Uh, a, a norm to trade that convenience. So what happens if we don't conform to these social norms though? We have privacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have privacy. Either that, uh, right, so enlightenment. You mean we don't have to use these? You mean it's not that much of a benefit to use these, but I'm still giving away all this privacy? I don't think I want to do that. So, I mean, there could be enlightenment, right? It's not always going to be the case. There could be alienation, right? It can cause a decrease in confidence, uh, anxiety, or increased anxiety. And it can affect relationships, right? Like, we used to go to grandma's house. Do we go to grandma's house anymore? No, we talked to her over the Echo Show. So how does that affect your relationship, honestly? I mean, it may not, it may. Uh, and then also affecting change. So it offers a new perspective, you know, folks that don't want to use these devices, but it requires the cool kids taking support and really, uh, or you know, being a stakeholder and really supporting you through that and affecting other people. So what happens if we conform? Well, we eat the cookies, right? We have a natural desire to conform through peer pressure and group judgment. So we have to accept that loss of privacy, which really isn't immediately quantifiable. And only at the cease of the use of the Alexa service can we really begin to, you know, I guess, calculate and not really to a finite degree of the effects of, of what's been reported or what we've you know, provided. So once again, I'm running low on time. We're mishandling exposure. Uh, I'm sorry. There's the potential for mishandling or exposure of data. So we can't trust that it's always going to be handled correctly, even though they say it is. And we're always trading convenience over privacy. This is the main thing here. Is that we're giving them bits of data so that we can go set a timer for an egg, right? And they can make mad cash. And that's just, I, I mean, yes, there, there is certain, uh, certain benefit, but it's just really, you know, it, it depends on that, that amount of detail that you're providing them. So we can take that control, we can still take steps, right? So we can have a proactive approach. And a lot of that's really built into uh, Amazon settings themselves. They've done a good job of that. I just think they could do a better job of publicizing it, right? Of making it more well known. So there's an interface there, the Alexa privacy. I'll go ahead and let you finish the quick picture. All right. And so there we can actually see the voice history, all the voice recordings that Alexa's ever recorded, right? Alexa, I'd like to watch The Office. Here's what I found. So it transcribed that one right there. It was able to tell what I was talking about. But this one up here, I didn't know what I was talking about. I was talking to my kids. So it's definitely important to review this type of information, I think, on a regular basis. Uh, to make sure that you know, there, there aren't any unintended uh, consequences there. And once again, the smart alert history, if you've got smart devices, you can see all that type of stuff here. Uh, I'm sorry, like uh, you know, the switches and the, the, the um, outlets and things of that nature. Uh, even smoke and CO2 detectors, right? And then this is really going to be the more general uh, third party home devices in which you interact with, where you can delete the history there. So it's also another cool point. And also to skill permissions, you can limit the permissions, or at least you can review them on here. So each skill that you're using, you can see what permissions they have for this various types of data. And finally, I mentioned this earlier, but the feature development, you can actually disable participation in this, and they will not be reviewing your recordings, although they may still hand select some of them from time to time. Uh, they will not go through that same uh, procurement process or that same review process. And I mean, another protection, just muted, right? So it's simple but effective. Um, you know, you have to go over there and, walk and press a button, right? I mean, it's kind of inconvenient, but <laughs> you trade convenience for privacy. So, what's the do you trust it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you trust it too? And once you mute it, do you trust it? Right? Do you trust that it's actually muted? All right, simple hat. All right, take it back on. All right.
or just plug it all together, right? No power, no problems. What does that mean? Right, yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh. But, but really, what's the point if you're unplugging it, right? Um, if, if you, you know, it, it's just, it, it really takes, you know, a certain expectation. You just have to have that hand-in-hand -hand expectation of privacy, right? Like, what you're giving away and what you're giving up convenience-wise. What's that? Shoot it. Yeah, shoot it. You can shoot it. You can throw it in the fire. Certainly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, real quick, just some alternatives. I just wanted to mention uh, not to try to, you know, sell people on not getting Alexa enabled devices, but there are, are open source alternatives out there that will actually store the data locally and not send it off. And you can do this on your own Raspberry Pi as well. And, um, I think Wes Widener in his talk, uh, Sound of Evil, actually talks about this a little bit, uh, and he mentions uh, this next thing I'm going to talk about. But yeah, Microsoft is that company. Pretty cool. I haven't done it yet, but uh, definitely interested in it. It's a little laggy. It's not a very, uh, good, it's not a very good user experience. Uh, it's it's not, have, have you tried one? Yeah. yeah uh, okay. I got you. Did you have the, the Mark 1? Uh, I've used it on Raspberry Pi. Oh, okay. I got you. Got you. Okay. Something to take into consideration. So, the other thing I was going to talk about is Project Alias. Have you seen Project Alias at all? No? Okay, so this is essentially, again, kind of a Raspberry Pi type thing and a 3D printer thing where you tie it all together and you're creating essentially a hat or a mask for this. Um, and then it's going to sit on top of there and it basically you know, intercepts any requests to that microphone, right? So, uh, you're essentially aliasing that activity. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I wanted you to return to the previous slide so I could get a picture of it. Sure, sure. Here, let me go. Let me go right there. Okay. All right, awesome. All right, so, so yeah, you know, and, and again, uh, like I said, uh, Wes Widener details this a little more technically in his talk. Um, so I would definitely check that out. Uh, he's on YouTube, he's on several B-sides, um, and he was just at this B-side today doing the same talk, so it's a very good... Very good talk. I encourage you to check it out. Um, but other than that, I will leave you some additional resources. Really, just the Alexa terms of use and the privacy settings, I think, are just a big help in themselves. Just what they're already publishing for you, uh, how to manage this data. Uh, and of course, Wes Widener down here. Check out his talk. There's his Twitter handle right there. You can reach me on Twitter, hit me up at the real W Lambert. And uh, that is all that I have for you guys today. <laughs>